Okay, so thank you everyone for coming to celebrate this Valentine's Day with us, because <laughs> I really appreciate that. So let me introduce today our speaker. It is Dr. Francisco Caredonda. He's a senior lecturer in the University of the Central Country of History and Science. He did a PhD in Philosophy and Mathematics. So I hope you are going to enjoy this interactive workshop today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nerea. Good morning, everybody. It's a big honor, but I'm so, one second. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, is everyone that is here are going to come for lunch later, or there's someone that will come? So you are not going to come? No. Yeah. Okay. So it's four minutes.
Okay, so thank you. Sorry about that. As I was saying, Nerea, thank you very much for the presentation. I was saying it's a big honor, but above all, it's a great pleasure joining the constituency in Cambridge of SR UK. As I said in London on Thursday, for me, it's something I need. Getting an excuse, an academic excuse for leaving Spain, problematic Spain, and coming to purifying air you have here and enjoying another atmosphere, another scientific atmosphere with you. I'm doing this since 2012, 2011, 2012. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. On this occasion, well, we are going to because we have people. And if I, have, if I was to speak English at home, I would have to pay 20 pounds for someone to listen to me. So here it's okay. So it's an exercise I can do for me. Well, we are supposed to make jokes here and then go straight on, seriously into the matter. Reconstructing the history of each and every science. Strange name. An interactive workshop. A new thing in SRU UK. Because we are going to divide the thing, the seminar, in two parts. I'm going to present the historiographical model I propose to you, and well, maybe we may take a rest for a work, the second part. And you will reconstruct the history, for example, of biology. Yes, teachers are that way. So, let's go for it. Introductory remarks. When I was doing my PhD in philosophy at the Department of Logic and Philosophy of Science in 1920, so, in 1990, <laughs> 1990, <laughs> 1920, <laughs> so long ago, 1990, I found this reference. Norman Campbell from the United Kingdom, Philosophical Magazine, who wrote on dimensions, dimensional analysis, which is basic in engineering and physics. Recent papers in this journal suggest the following remarks. Writers on dimensions usually ignore almost the whole of the past literature of the subject. The reason cannot be that they are taking for granted established doctrines, or it is notorious that almost every proposition about dimensions asserted by one writer has been denied by a writer of equal competence. The reason is probably precisely the opposite. Anyone who attempted to summarize the literature would become involved in so many controversies that it could get no further. But the absence of background makes it impossible to ascertain the significance of any particular contribution. The problem was in the 20s, in the 40s, and in the 80s. Someone writing in the Journal of the Franklin Institute on the origin of dimensional analysis were right. The complete history of dimensional analysis has not yet been written. Several authors have, at one time or another, complained of the vacancy. Well, I finished my PhD, PhD in 1992, and as I don't like getting bored, I started a second PhD <laughs> at the UPN on the history of dimensions, history of dimensional analysis. And for putting order, getting a coherent structure for dimensional analysis, I spent, as you see, 80 years. And the model is the model I'm going to introduce here. Uh, it's a model I use for solving several problems. For example, if we were to reorganize the history of astronomy, I think there is no astronomers here, right? No? No astronomers? Physicists? Any physicists around? So, perfect. So, you can help me if we need. If we were to start the history, for example, of astronomy in every book, in lessons and lecture, the speaker or the writer will go first through this. Supposedly, we will have here some kind of lunar cycle, and this would be the they would call the origin, the start of the history of astronomy. Yes. If we go on and we go to the Cantabrian region in northern Spain. We'll, we will find things like this. Again, we will think these are lunar cycles. There are several books, international books, talking about this, and they make this kind of analysis. If we go to science, the lunar science, in the 60s, Alexander Marshak 
published a paper on a piece of portable prehistorical art with notches. And the study he made concluded that there were cycles of the moon. And science published. So if we proceed in the history of astronomy, for example, and we go to Ireland, we will find some astronomical organization of the internal architecture of the monument, of the megalith monument. If we go, of course, to Salisbury, we will visit this jewel in our heritage, Stonehenge, which has been studied from the point of view of archaeoastronomy. Because of the distribution of the stones, the location of the hill stone, the well, you know, east, north, south, west, the orientation of the monument, and when does the sun rise? If we don't have clouds and hit <laughs> the altar stone after passing through the hill stone. If we will look at how the pyramids in Egypt were built we find that they are organized according to the cardinal points and more on an astronomical organization. If we go into mastabas or more pyramid stones, we would find things like the Inhado Temple, the map of heaven, stars, constellations, etc. If we go to the British Museum or to any archaeological museum here in the United Kingdom, we will find, for example, a new man underneath some clay tablets from Babylon or even previous locations where we find astronomical confused with atmospheric because by that time heavens here and heavens there have confused dating as far as the second or even the third millennium before christ with dates for lunar eclipses <coughs> phases of the moon nocturnal visibility of the moon month by month and all year or the mulabin clay tablets list Stars associated to gods, of course, and first Soviet with 18 constellations, maybe on previous to 12, intercommission of moons to match lunar and solar calendars, but that found the presence or absence of planets in the sky, etc. The next step in a standard approach to the history of astronomy would be going, for example, through Hesiod's Theogony, that mixture of the heavens, the gods, the creation of the earth, etc. You've seen on movies and everywhere. The next thing would be going into Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, where the earth is a thing that's surrounded by the river ocean, five or four rivers, seas and wells. And in the Iliad, we would find sentences like this. I'm going to limit to the limit of land to see ocean, the origin of the gods, who represents Represent the land, land, the sea, and the entire Helios, the absolute circularity of sleep, and all the stars that surround the Uranus, etc. etc. But of course, we get into personalities, living figures, you know, past, like Thales of Miletus, who studied all of you in your secondary high school, who was supposed to predict a solar eclipse in the sixth century before Christ, according to Herodotus. And then we will go through the Pythagoreans and their systems of the universe with the earth, with a counter earth which can see the heart of the universe in the center because the sun will be in the center of the universe and not even the earth. And the planets moving, revolving around that center of fire. More models like the uh, Ponticus, etc. Anyway, if I proceed this way, by the time we have to go for lunch, I have not reached Kepler's Lingos. There's no way. <laughs> and the, the chairwoman would say, come on, come on, how we have to have five minutes. So this standard approach to the history, for example, of astronomy, is not the correct one if we want to complete, uh, well, a complete view of the whole thing. Let's take another subject. Chemistry. Is there any chemist around? Sam. We have one. Sam. Sam. Perfect. <laughs> and the rest are by chemistry. So, <laughs> if we try to reconstruct the history of chemistry from a standard orthodox origin, we would say, where is the first use of, uh, what we would call today chemistry, 
Well, we will go, for example, to Cape Art, Altamira, Lascaux, etc., etc., because we find they use ochre. Well, the reddish color from hematite, and that's here, the formalized one, and an hydroxide oxide, or some kind of yellow ochre, limonite, well, hydrated iron oxide, manganese oxide, charcoal, of course, animal fat, etc. And we would call this the start of chemistry. Of course, the next step will be metallurgy. The use taken from impossible origin rocks, first copper, then bronze, then iron, which gives name to ages in our past, ancient bronze age, iron age, etc. And again, if we go to our museums, we will find clay tables, for example, with recipes for making red glass. Text written with a spurious ancient page to give an impression of our the farther we go backwards, the more valuable is the clay. And we find pharmacy. Well, I didn't translate this, sorry. But this large medical, they say, compendium, the six columns that contains prescription and spells in Sumeria. To cure a range of medical problems, though to have been called, thought to have been called by witchcraft. Witchcraft? Gods. That's scientific. But anyway, we will find also pharmacopoeia in, in Egypt, for example, in those two papyrus, Evers and even Smith papyrus, because all of you know how Egyptians had good knowledge of anatomy and made use of important um, substances for the mummies, preserving for the future their bodies. And again, we will jump into the ancient Greeks. We will find again Thales of Miletus considering one element, water, as the arcade or origin of everything. And Pedocles would, in the number of four basic elements, the roots of everything. Plato would associate those four elements to four platonic solids, four polyhedra, fire associated to tetrahedron, earth to hexahedron, air to octahedron, water to the cosahedron. And as they found a fifth regular polyhedra, perfect. Because as we see, nature is not that way. We cannot fix this into this, into this. Maybe we'll find a fifth element that goes around everything, covering those connections we cannot see. Perfect. And Aristotle would even say something very similar, almost literally to say each of the four elements must be related to two of the four sensible qualities. So water will be primary cold and secondary wet, earth primary dry and secondary cold, etc., etc. Et Again, if we proceed this way, there is no way we will reconstruct today the history of chemistry. No way. We will have to go through alchemy in the Greeks, <coughs> alchemy in the Arabs, in the Middle Ages, etc. So, this is the summary I sent Maria. I don't know if she could distribute it. And we said, things like, while organizing the history of a scientific discipline, for example, astronomy, chemistry, made on the occasion of a lecture or a full course, the problem always arises. We get surprised, etc., etc., etc. In sum, we will have not come to explain Johannes Kepler's three laws by the time the moderator wants us that we have five minutes left. Mm -hmm. Or our students remind us that the final exam is scheduled to be not time. And the problem will be similar if the subject matter instead of this astronomy would be physics, chemistry, or math. So what are we going to do to give you tools for reconstructing the history of whatever you want? Well, the model came, it's probably here, you have to just Google a little bit and you find it. The case of the first science in history, mathematics. Very simple, very simple science compared to the rest. And the thing is the following. When you want to write a paper on anything, the first thing you must ask yourself is, what am I going to write about? What is the object of my paper? If you want to reconstruct the history of uh, discipline, mathematics, first thing you should ask yourself, chemistry or whatever is, what is chemistry? What is biology? What is physics? What is mathematics? Well, it's very easy in this case. Mathematics is a science. Right, but it's a science. 
Well, as Daniel Campion understood, as a set of scientific theories. What is a theory? Well, a theory is a hypothetical deductive system. It starts some hypotheses or axioms or postulates. We uh, state several theorems, we prove them, and once we have those, we prove them new, uh, new theorems. In your first year, you all have to enjoy or suffer, it depends, and the teacher who came from the Department of Mathematics to teach you algebra or to teach you analysis. And he used to come and say, hello, good morning, theorem, blah, 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 blah. and two blackboards completely full of demonstration. Uh, that's nothing I fix. Well, that's a hypothetical deductive system. So that's the next thing. When did we have a mathematical theory? If we say mathematics is a set of a theory of theories, in the precise moment we got the first mathematical theory, we will have the first expression of mathematics as a science. Well, that's very easy in the case of mathematics. Because we find it in increase of action, the elements. So, when did the history of mathematics divide? In increase elements. Right? Of course, you can choose a different criterion or criterion for organizing <coughs> the history of your discipline. So, don't listen to me and just that. Think at the same time, how are you going to organize the history of biology? Because it's going to be your task in the second part of this. I work the first part and don't run away, close the door, because you are not hiding after you, if you don't reconstruct the history of violence. Following this, I'm joking just a little bit. So, was there no mathematics before you did? My answer is no. We cannot call that mathematics if we say that mathematics is a science. It's a different thing. And if it's not mathematics, what is it? What is it then? Well, Greeks provided us with two prefixes that we use on Thursday to organize the history of a story. Okay? Pre and proto. Pre history and proto history of every science. Pre and proto are two prefixes which provide which refer to something that happened previously to the suffix, in this case, to history. And what's the difference between pre and proto? Pre means previous, but of a different nature as the suffix. While proto means previous, all right, but of the same, of very close nature as the suffix. So this is going to give us tools for reorganizing every science. For example, this is Euclid's Elements, the origin, the first statements, definitions. What are we talking about in this theory called geometry? Gives definitions of the objects. What are we talking about? Once we know what we are going to talk about, he states common notions. Common to all the sciences. Things which are equal to the same thing are also equal to one another. If equals be added to equals, the whole is equal. If equals be subtracted, etc., the whole is greater than the part. These five common notions are useful for every science. For this particular science called mathematics, identified with geometry, five postulates. We are allowed to draw a straight line from any point to any point. To produce a fine line, find a straight line, continuously in a straight line. So from a segment, we say in Spanish, we can draw a rect, a line. We have circles. We have right angles which are equals among them. And the fifth postulate, the parallel postulate, two lines are parallel if they meet in infinity. With all, only these five postulates and all those definitions, he constructs the whole of mathematics. First proposition of first postulate, which makes use of Sorry, first proposition or first theorem, which is going to make use in the demonstration in the proof of postulate 3, postulate 3, postulate 1, definition 17, etc. The next theorem is going to be proof using all the previous ones, and so on, and so on, and so on. For the first time in history, we have a science. 
Because for the first time in history, we have a theory. Because for the first time in history, we have a hypothetical deductive reorganization of a field of knowledge. In this case, geometry. So, we cannot call this mathematics. Because if we look inside, what, what do we have inside? For example, in this problem, we have two circular walls. The distance between them are five units. It's a sectional uh, system counting of the value minus. And the area between those two borders, 6.15. That's not mathematics. That's the type of mathematics you would use in primary school, at the beginning of your secondary school, where you always resolve or solve problems with particular numbers. In your secondary school or even your high school, maybe you make use of theorems, the theorem of the cosine, the theory of the sine, but it's very hard, difficult you got a demonstration of it. But in any case, the teacher never came in your institute of the high school, demonstrating things, organizing, organizing the whole thing, the whole discourse, connecting one theory with the other. That happened in your university, and only in university. In university, you were taught mathematics, <laughs> while in your high school, you were taught, you were taught proto mathematics, and in your primary school, you were taught pre-mathematics. You cannot call mathematics something which is not organized hypothetical deductive in a hypothetical deductive way. And the same happens with the rest of the subjects. They are organized in the teaching in those three periods. <coughs> so, where does the proto-history of mathematics start? When the first mathematician stated general theory. Not like here. No general theory is here. No general theory is here. We are only solving problems, particular problems. We particular call that a science. That's solving problems. Everyday problems. Solving problems for our common life. Here, the same. But here, Thales of according to Proclus, states the first general statements, scientific statements. He doesn't prove them, but states things that refer to all the circles to all the triangles, to all the lines, without measures. It is almost mathematics, proto-mathematics, almost mathematics. With that structure, we can do things in a different way. So we can organize things in a different way. We can spend five minutes or ten minutes to reorganize a whole thing, as I've done with mathematics. We have mathematics, but we have the first mathematical theory, and the previous things will be pre-history of mathematics, proto-history of mathematics. The thing is finding a milestone for making a cut in the historical evolution of mathematics. We have found two milestones. Thales, as the first, who provides general statements, and Euclid, who provides the first theory. Yeah, but don't think about mathematics. Think about biology, because it's going to be your turn in a few minutes. <laughs> How are we going to find those milestones in the evolution of biological sciences, or chemistry, or physics, or whatever, to make those cuts that makes us decide that my science, biology, or whatever, started here? Because before that, it wasn't scientific. If it was almost scientific, it would be proto-scientific. If we would have the proto-history of that science. If it was far from scientific, but we needed to organize our history, it would be pre-scientific. It would belong to the pre-history of my science. So let's do it with, for example, astronomy. We need a criteria of scientificity, right? We are not talking about law, we are not talking about economics, we are not talking about politics, we are talking about science. So we need a criterion for scientificity. What kind of criteria for scientificity of astronomy are we going to find? Plato, in his economics, would say, we give the name of astronomy to this subject. The real astronomer feels the need of other science. 
He's not the man that makes astronomy as SEO in the cosmopolis we said before, and the kind of observing the rising and setting of the stars. An astronomer is a man that observes seven of the eight celestial revolutions as planet, moon, sun, etc. Each describing a circle in a manner no man could easily understand unless he had received outstanding skills. So, what is astronomy? The scientific field astronomers are devoted to. Astronomy, from Greek, but the other world, means the law of the stars. Is then, for example, we can define it in this way. It's a natural science that studies celestial objects, movements, the phenomena related to them, their register, and the investigation of their origin. All this information for medical radiation or any other means. Right? So it's, once we know what we are going, what we are talking about, we maybe can reconstruct its history. It, it's historical evolution. We have the uh, historical object, astronomy as a science. And to organize it, we need observation, direct observation or using instruments. Right? And we have to look what the definition says. We must make a mathematical study of that that has been observed. First of all, we make a geometrical, arithmetical, and trigonometrical analysis because we have to find the position of selection of this static instance. How do we study that with those tools? Through what we call physical quantities. All mathematical mathematical quantities at this stage: length, area, angle, and measures. But if we go further, apart from geometry, as metrics or trigonometry, there is another scientific field called kinematics, <coughs> which tells us how are movements described. It's a description, not a cause or explanation of the movements, but a description. For it, we need another two physical quantities, time and velocity. But we haven't explained why things move. How can we explain why things move? That theory is called dynamics. Why of motion? Which are the causes of motion? There are two causes. Mass, active mass, acting as in the mm, gravitational field, as attracting bodies. I attract a wireless body, the world attracts my <laughs> body. Each of you, my cover, are being attracted. Some of you are more attracted than others. Some of you are more attracted than others, from a physical point of view. And force as the cause of motion. Right. So, if this is the scientific study of the information we get through instruments or through our eyes, how can we and when can we decide that astronomy became scientific? And it wasn't scientific <laughs> before. <clears throat> well, you can choose many milestones. You can choose Galileo, you can choose uh, Kepler, you can choose Newton. We are going through all of them in a minute. In, but I want to provoke <laughs> you, and I want to provoke your way of thinking. Why not using this milestone? And why this milestone? We have Emperor Napoleon and Laplace, yes, Simon de Laplace, who has written the system of the war. He brings Emperor Napoleon the book. Napoleon is a highly skilled man, he's a scientist, army men in France at the end of the 18th, the 18th century are the most advanced scientists in France, say in the world, almost. So he understands perfectly well the book he has received. And he calls for Laplace and says, hey, you Laplace, come here. <laughs> you have written an extraordinary book. Well, we don't know exactly if it's the position du système du monde or the first volume of the Traité de Mechanique Celeste about the universe. But in it, you have not mentioned, not even once, the creator. And at last, answer to Napoleon. Sir, that's, that is an hypothesis I have not made. 
for the first time in order to explain the movements of planets of heavenly bodies, God was not needed. <laughs> At the end of the 18th century, around 1800, for the first time in history, so we are thinking about biology. How <laughs> <laughs> so biology? When can we say biology became a science? Because if astronomy needed God, I if it needed mass, force, velocity, time, what that scientific need in God, who would say that that need that's a physical quantity in our, our scientists? No one would say so. So it could not be scientific before that. It could be proto-scientific, it could be pre-scientific. But by no way we could say it was scientific. I'm provoking. <laughs> just provoking. And I'm giving you tools. You can reorganize things the way you want. But I propose this. Because in the last point of view, astronomy was organized in the form of mathematical equations. That means algebra, equalities, equations, and also analysis, calculus, differentials, etc. With these quantities, length, physical quantities, time, mass, force, but not God. But that's the end of the 18th century. And what was the 18th century characterized by? Enlightenment, significant scientists as Euler, Lagrange, etc and the mathematical expression of mechanics. The fundamental law of dynamics, force equals mass multiplied by acceleration, spread in the three spatial <coughs> direction <coughs> components, x, y, z. We have equations, we have algebra, we have, we have analysis, but still we need a goal. Would you say that scientific, strictly speaking, almost scientific, of course. How am I not going to say this is scientific? But we need God for explaining the movement of the planets. It is. <laughs> and you say, well, but if we were to find a milestone in all this, you have to say, Isaac Newton, and his principia, with the law of gravitation, First, the law of dynamics, the two physical, the first physical theories, dynamics and gravitation. That's the standard. Yes, he uses, we say it, these quantities, mm. but he is God. Mm. And apart from that, he writes this way mm. no equations at all, and no calculator, no differential calculus, only geometry. Euclidean geometry, the same geometry we find in Euclid's elements. No algebra and no analysis. That's the task for the 18th century. Look, force equals mass multiplied by acceleration, how stated by Newton. The alteration of motion is ever proportional to the motif force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line in which that force is impressed. That's the rhetorical fundamental law of dynamics according to Newton. If we go to gravitation, we will try to find this. Force equals the gravitational constant, the power of masses, the inverse square of distance, and the vector, because we are talking about a vectorial three-dimensional equation. Can we find this? No. The circumjovial planets, the moons, by running drawn to Jupiter's center, describe areas proportions to the times of description. In order to get to this, Newton has to go to explaining phenomenon one, phenomenon two, that the five primary planets with their several orbits encompass the sun. We go to the theorems, the forces by which the circumjovial, the moons of Jupiter, planets are continually drawn off from reticular, rectilinear motions and retaining the proper orbits tend to Jupiter's center and are reciprocally as the squares of the distances, places of those planets. 
so on, so on, so on. No equations, no algebra, no calculus in Newton. A lot of gold. Gold everywhere. Because there are several problems. And uh, though these bodies may indeed persevere in their orbits like mere laws of gravity, they could by no means have at first derived the regular position of the orbits themselves from those laws. No way. We need another thing. We need the dominion of one capital letters. The one. <laughs> this beam capital letter, governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all. And on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God, or universal ruler. For God is a relative word and has a respect to servants. And deity is the dominion of God, not over his own body. The supreme God is a being eternal, the In order to organize heavens, Newton needed God. I didn't have audio, I didn't have analysis. So, you say Newton is completely historically scientific? <laughs> <laughs> well, Lord, 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 etc., 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 in this principle. So, according to this model, I think in no more than 10, 15 minutes, I have reorganized the history of astronomy. I think. 10 minutes for maths, 15 minutes for astronomy. Because this model, historiographical model, I think there are three periods in the historical evolution of astronomy. History, history, the history of science, not pre-science or proto-science. Stage in the mathematical study of celestial objects and the motion since celestial mechanics made unnecessary the hypothesis of God. Until present time. But history. <coughs> For the first time, when we got rid of that hypothesis, astronomy became scientific. The history starts there. Well, and before that, because for constructing celestial mechanics, the class needed many discoveries. Well, of course, the transition from his dawn, the dawn of history. And we could locate here, of course, Newton. Of course we all love Newton. How are we not going to love Newton in Cambridge? What do you mean here? <laughs> of course. But in the in between, from history and history, according to my point of view, you have been thinking whatever because you have to do the same in biology in five minutes. Proto history, stage in the mathematical study of celestial objects and their motion with the tools of geometry and kinematics. Protoastronomy. Of course, between prehistory and protohistory, you can put whatever you want. Some milestones, not high rank milestones, but prehistory, stage in the observation and pre scientific study of celestial objects and their motion. Pre astronomy. Right, so who created? Laws by Kepler. Of course, we must take into account Galileo Galilei. How are we not going to do that if we are supposed to know that he said God has written the universe in mathematical language? <laughs> no, that's not what Galileo wrote. In his Aviatore, he wrote this. Philosophy is written on this immense book which is always open before our eyes. I mean the universe. It cannot be understood unless one does not understand first its language, the character of its writing. The universe is written, written <laughs> in mathematical language. Yes, but what's the mathematical language for Galileo? Algebra and calculus? No. Its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical things. But with that, that kind of Mathematical tools, we are not going to explain the universe. No. He provided an interesting study of terrestrial kinematics, but with the mathematics of Euclid, exactly the same mathematics that we find in Euclid are mainly Archimedes, but not with algebra or calculus. Of course, he used the telescope 
indeed, uh, he gave birth to observation of science when he found dots in the moon, volcanic, not volcanic because of the asteroids hitting, meteors hitting the surface of the moon, he discovered that the heavenly bodies were not pure, immaculate. They were corrupt, as in the earth, on the surface of the earth. And he contributed. And of course, how are we not going to recall Copernicus? Because as Copernicus who decided there is no way to match observation with theory if we don't put in the center of the solar system, the universe in those days, the sun, and we remove the earth. Because it's true, every person sits and sees, if we don't have clouds, the sun rising and the sun moving while I'm staying, doing nothing. But scientifically speaking, what moves is not the sun, it's the earth around the sun. And it was Copernicus the first to do that. And of course, we must say that he was almost scientific. Well, with this frame, now I could slide through the history of astronomy, reorganizing the prehistory and going very fast. We will find prehistorical notches, etc. We will find Altamiras, pendants. We will find megaliths in Antiquaria, Malaga, here in England, etc. Of course, everything referred to astronomical concepts in ancient civilizations cannot be called astronomy. I think, in this side, we should call it prehistory. That's not scientific. Well, political, but that's not scientific. If you love the Maya, the end of the war in 2012, you remember it happened, but it was announced supposedly, for example, in the Dresden Codex. You should not call that scientific. I'm not going to it. Of course, they made studies of the moon and they had many constants, astronomical constants, but that's not scientific. That's prehistory of astronomy. In between the prehistory of astronomy and the protohistory, of course, we can locate some scientists like Thales of Leto, supposedly predicted a solar eclipse of Pythagoras, which decided that the universe was all but number. The universe is a cosmos, an order entity. That's, of course, we need this. We need those forerunners to get to a scientific stage. The models of the universe and Plato's order at the academy. The order is this. Think, I order you to think about the history of time. What well, Plato order, think of a geometrical representation of the movement of the sun, the moon, and the planets under two conditions. Motion must be circular, and the earth has to be. It's almost scientific. That's the origin of the proto history of astronomy according to this point of view. We will study the laws of Nidos, we will study Aristarchus of Samos, who proposed a model with the sun in the center of the solar system. We will study Eratosthenes of Sibene and the size and distance of the moon and the circumference of the earth. We will study Apollonius of Perga and the use of conics to understand how, if we locate the Earth in the center of the universe, things don't work well, and we have to find cycles and epicycles to try to organize things, Claudius Ptolemy, who would summarize in the equivalent to Euclid elements the astronomical concepts of the Greeks, and this complicated model to solve the unsolvable, because you cannot locate the Earth in the center of the solar system. The Soviet, and we will become the first woman in the history of science, of course, I have to do this in Patriarch of Alexandria, who, you know, had a end for his life. And the proto history of astronomy would go right on through the Middle the Christian Middle Ages and mainly through the Islamic Middle Ages. Batani, Omar Hayyan, and the Aparismi, and the School of Translators. You know, Spain, love Spain, which is there, always a reference for all of you. And we will have our Alfonso X Sario, Alfonso X Sario, 
Okay, we'll see kings. We <laughs> should have kings like that. We will go through the Renaissance, the Urbach, the his disciples, Chico Bryant, and trying to not get into conflict after Copernicus' contribution with the Earth, and almost getting into the history of astronomy. And here we will find Copernicus, we will find Galileo Galilei with terrestrial um, kinematics, with his dialogue, we will find Johannes Kepler with his laws, and we will find Isaac Newton, and we will end up reorganizing the model from an orthodox point of view, chronologically, from the start to the end. Or the end of the start. That would be the origin of history. So, I've finished <coughs> the first part of the workshop. Thank you very much. <coughs> Have you got any questions before we proceed torturing you? <laughs> I come very fast because my point was to show that you can you can reconstruct the history of each and every science in one moment. <laughs> I think we've done it for mathematics. I think we've done it, we've done it for astronomy. Um, Francisco Pablo is going to help me for doing it with physics. But you have here. Come on. Will you volunteer? Will you reconstruct the history of physics right now? <laughs> what about a very big history of chemistry? Are you ready? Uh, oh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we are thinking about it. When do you think chemistry became scientific? Um, I love annoying my students. <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking because uh, you said this thing about God, no? But there are still some, some very good scientists now. Mm. But still, after all the theories and everything, they say no, no, but, but, but the origin is God. Still now. So, so then, is, is that science or? Okay, going back to that when we pull 